Steve Albini. I am the owner of Electrical Audio, and uh, part of my collection of microphones are these microphones here. These microphones were brought with me and used on the Nirvana in Utero record, and they were immortalized in a photograph that appeared in a reissue anniversary edition of the album In Utero. Since that photograph came out, these microphones have become historical artifacts. As soon as I was aware that these things have become important and significant and valuable, I had to take them out of circulation in the studio. And so I contacted the surviving members of Nirvana, uh, Dave Grohl, who was with Pat Smear when I contacted him, and Chris Novoselic. And I said, hey, I have these microphones now. They are now significant and important and I can't use them as microphones. Do you have a repository for things like this, for memorabilia or artifacts associated with Nirvana? And both of them instantly said, well, you should sell them. So I feel like uh, I should sell them and get them into the hands of somebody who would take care of them and, and not put them at risk in the hectic environment of a recording studio. We set up the three close mics so that Kurt could hear the difference between the microphones when he was singing. Uh, on certain songs, we used two simultaneously, and those were typically panned in stereo. So, and he heard that effect in his headphones, and he was toying with it slightly, like moving his head around while he was singing as a way to sort of animate the vocal in stereo. It's a very subtle effect. It's not something that I think is, you know, that's not part of what makes the record good or anything. These are Lomo 19A9s. They're a, a tube condenser microphone. Fairly standard applications, like a, they get used on acoustic instruments a lot. The, in, on the Nirvana session, these mics were used as overheads on Dave Grohl's drum kit, and then one of them was used on Kurt Cobain's vocals. And this is the one that's immortalized in the photograph next to this guy. The PL20 was one of the first professional quality microphones that I bought. I bought it from a place called Gary Gand Music, uh, which is a music dealership north of Chicago in like Northbrook or whatever. It was part of the original package of microphones that I bought when I started making eight track recordings in the basement of my house. I used to have a house about a mile from here. There's a third microphone in that photograph, a Sennheiser 421. I couldn't identify that microphone out of the group of them that we have. So I'm gonna pretend that it wasn't mine and uh, I, I don't have an important historical Sennheiser 421. I probably do, I just don't know which one it is. In the photograph you can see like certain distinguishing characteristics of the microphones. And so I was able very, very quickly to discern which of these two microphones was used in the vocal session they were both used in the drum recording session, but the vocals were recorded as overdubs afterward. We have two sets of these microphones. The number of bars in the grill differ from one set to another. So we knew which set I had used because we could count the number of bars in the grill. Then between the two, I could tell which one was used in the vocal session. This one is still bright and shiny, and this one has some very mild spots of oxidation. And you could see very faintly, you could see the spots on the photograph. So I knew that this microphone was the one that was used in the vocal session. There are two little arrows drawn on the tops of the microphone that show the directionality of the microphone. Those little arrows were drawn post the Nirvana session because when Electrical Audio opened, we had visiting engineers come in here and they were sometimes con confused about which side of this microphone was the business side. The PL20, there's a, the wire basket under this frame is shaped to a very mild cone, right? There's a flat surface on the front and then there's a very subtle conical contour here. All of our other ones, this conical shape is flatter than this, and I, you, could, you could see the geometry of it from the, the sort of raking light in the photograph. You could, there's also the switch on the back, the little lever on the switch. Um, there are some that have a round cross section and some that have a square cross section. And I was able to tell from the photograph this one had a square cross section, so that eliminated one of the microphones. By a process of elimination, I am satisfied that this is the microphone in that picture. 
they were just part of the normal working arsenal of the studio. We have an, a, a rather large collection of microphones, which is necessary to accommodate all of the different things that happen in a studio. And they're irreplaceable. Like, you can't get another 1909 that Kurt Cobain sang into and is historically important. You just, there, there's no, there isn't, they're irreplaceable. In that sense, they just, they stop being microphones and they're now artifacts. And uh, I feel like I should respect them in, as part of the historical record and get them into the hands of somebody who would treat them like that. Mm -hmm.